evening everyone this is our fourth and final biology class so we have finished uh the entire biology from five syllabus in this class uh. so um in this class we will be talking about uh second parts of plant which is uh, going to be the other four chapters lah. okay so let's start with chapter four all right let's start with chapter four okay so chapter four is about transport in plants now transport of course in your head you know already lah. that means will involve the xylem and phloem for transpiration and translocation okay vascular tissue you already know there are two types xylem and phloem lah. okay transport water and mineral salt by the roots is uh, during transpiration by xylem and also translocation transport organic compounds synthesized by leaf during photosynthesis by the phloem okay now we actually have two types of plant one is vascular one is non-vascular vascular that means like the tall plants lah. you have the xylem and phloem to transport non-vascular is like the flat plants like moss you don't have any xylem or phloem okay so um now you have to know the structure for xylem and phloem and also their uh, function lah, okay so xylem vessel consists of dead cells at maturity remember xylem doesn't have a cytoplasm and it's dead cell because you see um if xylem is made up uh, uh living cells they will absorb the water during transpiration then the other parts of the plant they cannot get the water right so that's why it has to be dead cells like xylem okay cells are arranged longitudinally Tudinally from end to end to form a continuous hollow tube. Lah. That means from the leaf all the way to the root is one continuous hollow tube. Lah. Okay. And then the walls of xylem uh, have uneven lignin thickening. Okay. They are lignified because to provide mechanical support and strength. Lah, okay. Prevent the plant from being bent. And also, okay, besides xylem, there are also other small, small uh, vessels called tracheid. Okay. So, kawan dia tracheid lah which has lignin thickening and pits to allow water movement to adjacent cell. That means from in the xylem and then it will move to the uh, size beside, uh, the cells beside through the pits lah in the tracheid. Okay. Untuk xylem, kawan dia ialah tracheid. Tapi untuk phloem, kawan dia ialah uh, companion cell. Okay. So phloem and uh, you look at the phloem and also the sieve tube element all these companion cell lah, okay sieve tube do not have nucleus ribosome or vacuole because they already matured at this stage lah, okay this allows sucrose molecules to pass through sieve tubes easily okay uh, on both ends of the sieve tube there is a sieve plate that has passed through which organic compounds can flow from one sieve tube to the next lah. that means you see there's a perforation plate and then there will be pores lah for the sucrose to be transported Companion cells, okay, the kawan dia akan, uh, will have the mitochondria lah to provide energy in the form of ATP for active transport of sucrose. Later on, we'll see the how does the process work, okay? So, transport of water and mineral salts. Now, for xylem, okay, ah, okay, the root has cell and then all the water, the water will move in lah, okay, uh, because of the low water potential inside. So let's see. Water potential in root hair cell is lower compared to water in the soil. So constant water potential in the soil water is higher lah compared to root hair cell. So mineral ions are actively pumped by the root hair cell into the vacuole causing the cell set of the root hair to have low water potential. Okay. Can you all understand? I hope you all understand. Lah. Okay. Um, that means I absorb mineral salt Sini sudah banyak solid dan mineral salt dalam. So, water potential akan lower dalam sini. Atas, di luar sini, outside here, the soil is higher water potential. That's why it will diffuse inside. Okay? And then the water move from the soil diffuse into the root, hair cells and epidermal cells via osmosis. Okay? Always osmosis if water. High water potential in root hair cell cause the water diffuse from the root hair cells into the cortex via osmosis. And then continue lah, from the epidermis to cortex, endodermis, pericycle, xylem, continue, continue. Okay, all these different layer, it will continue lah, all these different layer, the water from here, go here, here, to here, and finally to the xylem lah. Okay, the water. Okay, so this is root pressure. Now, um, yeah, into the xylem and then the xylem will go up. Lah. Okay, but before we continue with the rest, you look at the bioexploration. This is very important. Okay, 
So water movement from the root cells to the xylem happens in two ways. One is the symplast pathway and the other is through the apoplast pathway. Okay, now look, what is symplast pathway? Symplast pathway is like this. Okay, let's say, okay, this is the cell, this is the cell, this is the cell. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's say this is the uh, the the cells la, of the plant. Okay. So symplast pathway that means water moves through a uh, cytoplasm and plasmodesmata. Okay. Cytoplasm. I'm sure everyone knows really la, uh, Okay. The cytoplasm sini, cytoplasm sini, cytoplasm sini. Okay. Plasmodesmata means each um, plant cell, they have like small, small connection between the plant cell. This one, we call it the plasmodesmata. Okay. So, simplast pathway means they direct enter the cell. The water enter the cell macam tu saja. Simplast pathway. Okay. Okay or not? Simplast pathway. I hope it's clear. Is the board too dark or what? I hope it's clear. Okay. All right. Okay. Simplast pathway. Okay. Now, how about apoplast pathway? Apoplast pathway. Uh, I draw here lah. Okay. Apoplast uh, pathway. Okay. Same thing. There are cells like that. Okay. Like that. Like that. Okay. And then you have. Okay. Like that. Like that. Yeah. Okay. okay, but instead of you see, instead of going uh, through the cytoplasm and plasmodesmata, it will move through the spaces between cellular fiber at the cell wall. It will move at the cell wall. Dia bukan direct ya. Dia you see from here go up like that. Go up cell wall, cell wall. Okay, and then here this is the water. Okay, this is apoplast pathway. So, water moves in these two different pathways. But you see, because the cell walls in the endodermis layer have Casparian strip which are not permeable to water. Okay, so water cannot move through apoplast pathway but through symplast pathway. So, when it reaches the endodermis and pericycle, there is Casparian strip here blocking already, lignified. That's why it cannot go through the cell wall. It has to go directly through simplast pathway lah in the end. You look at the diagram also can see clearly lah. The pink color in the end must become blue. Uh, and then continue to the xylem lah. Okay. I hope you understand here. Okay. Now let's look at this first, uh, the, the other two types of the transpiration process lah. Okay. The other one we call it, uh, okay, root pressure is not enough, okay? Root pressure for tall plants is not enough. That's why you have capillary action. Now, what is capillary action? Let's say this is a water molecule. This is another water molecule. Okay, this is another water molecule, okay? And then this is the xylem wall, okay? The uh, forces between these two, Water molecule, you already learn in chemistry, hydrogen bond, is also called as cohesion forces or cohesive forces, the same thing. Lah. Okay. Water with other uh, atoms or particles or substances, lah, okay, with the cells out here, this is the xylem, this is the adhesion forces. Okay. So, because of these cohesive forces and adhesive forces, okay, uh, textbook is used one, uh, uh, adhesion and cohesion, okay, it's the same thing. Uh. So, because of these forces, there will be capillary action, uh, okay, you see, movement of water molecule in xylem is also helped by the capillary action of xylem produced by adhesion and cohesion forces and transpirational pool. That's why it can move continuously upwards, uh. okay, how about transpirational pool? Transpirational pool actually is simple only. Lah. Basically, because you see the leaf, the water all evaporate ready. Okay, in the leaf here, the water all evaporate ready. So the concentration of water is lower. Lah. So when it comes to the plant, okay, here has higher water potential. That's why it will pull up. Lah, okay, 
there will be a transpirational pull to pull everything up. This is what we call as transpirational pull. Okay, what, uh, okay, transpiration occur, water diffuse out, water vapor between the surrounding, okay, and then the spongy mesophyll lose water, low water potential, water molecules diffuse, diffuse from neighboring cells via spongy mesophyll cell by osmosis, and then movement produces a fox called transpirational pool, okay, so this is the three types of uh, transportation. Can you all understand this one? Can see clearly or not? I hope can see clearly. Yeah. Okay, can uh, very good. Okay, next we will look at gutation. Another process besides transpiration in uh, plants is gutation. Gutation also release water, but it's not water vapor. It's water droplets. Okay, you see why? Through a special structure called hydatode. Okay, at the end of the leaf, some leaf or most leaf. The special structure at the end here, there's like a hole here. Lah. We call it hydatodes. So this is where the gutation occurs. Lah. The water droplets will be released lah, at hydatodes. Okay. So you see, uh, at the end of the leaf wind without involving stomata caused by high root pressure. Okay. Gutation occurs when the root pressure and rate of transpiration is low. Condition usually occurs at night and early morning when the air humidity is high. Lah. That means like after a rain or early morning like that. Because inside so much water, to prevent the leaf vein from bursting or the plant too much water uh, pressure inside, it has to release the water do droplets. But not through stomata, not through transpiration. It's through the hydatodes. Okay, this is what we call gutation. Lah. Okay, so you see the similarities and differences. Similarity, both process occur through the leaf, both process cause permanent water loss from the plant. But the difference is gutation happens at night and early morning. Okay, whereas transpiration hoppers on happens on hot and windy days to cool down the plant, regulate water content. Gutation happens in herbaceous plant, whereas transpiration happens in all plants. Because you see, um, if you are non-herbaceous plant, woody plant, very strong, right? Can tahan, right? The pressure inside. That's why gutation only in herbaceous plant. Okay. Water is released in the form of water droplets for gutation, but transpiration is water vapor. Lah. Okay. Gutation is uh, hydatodes, but uh, transpiration is stomata. Gutation happens when root pressure is high. Transpiration is controlled by stomata opening and closing. Gutation release water that is rich in mineral because this is like the pure water, not to say pure water, lah, like the raw water from the soil you straight away release. But you see, for transpiration, because it releases water vapor, that's why it's pure water. No minerals or what. Lah, okay? Now, condition of plants that do not undergo transpiration or gutation. If there's no gutation, how? Like I said, lah, water pressure high, it will burst. Lah, you see? Uh, effective root pressure cannot be maintained. The leaf vein pressure becomes high and causes the leaf vein to burst. This leads to, leads to leaf being exposed to pathogen and eventually fall. Okay, for no transpiration, that means you cannot maintain the water pressure, cannot cool down. Uh, increase in temperature lah, can cause the uh, enzyme to denature and disrupt biochemical process. Mineral ion such as potassium ion cannot be transported from the roots to the leaf. Without transpiration, water transport throughout the plant will be disrupted and causes the plant to wilt. Plants can die in the long run. Okay, so, that so now let's look at translocation. Trans just now, transpiration is water and mineral salt from the roots to the leaf. Now the balik translocation because photosynthesis is from the leaf. That's why the produce, the glucose, sucrose all will be transported to the other parts of the plant. Okay, so translocation is a process of transporting organic substances such as sucrose, amino acid and hormones to the phloem from the leaf to other parts of the plant such as root and stem. Okay, now let's look at a um, pathway of translocation. How does it work? Uh, this one is um, a bit more complex compared to transpiration, okay? Because it involves actually both them. So, translocation. Okay, you have your xylem over here. Okay, any xylem lah, okay? Xylem. And then you have your, uh, uh, your phloem. Okay, phloem, remember, you have your perforation plate. This one, xylem, is continuous, hollow, but you see phloem, there will be the perforation plate like that, separating, okay, your sieve tube element, and then you have your companion cell, 
and then you have your uh, leaf lah. Okay, your leaf over here lah. Okay, your leaves over here. Okay. Now, see what happens. Okay, look at the mechanism. Okay, this is flown. I label first. It is companion cell. Okay. How does the mechanism work? It's like this, the process. Okay, number one. Sucrose is actively transported into the sieve tube. Okay, you see. Here, sucrose banyak. Because photosynthesis ma. Okay. Sucrose is high over here. Okay. Tapi sini, in the plant itself, it's even higher. Sucrose lagi tinggi di sini. Because the plant ma the nutrient. So, from low concentration to high concentration, it go against the concentration gradient. It will be active transport lah. So, active transport here lah. Okay, this is the first process. Okay, now you see. Transport of sucrose into the sieve tube through the companion cell from the leaf cells. Okay, uh, from the companion cell, it will go into the phloem. Lah. Okay, it goes into the phloem. How? Water potential uh, will be lower. Okay, you see. Because solute, the sucrose already uh, come into here. So, concentration of sucrose is high. H2O concentration is low lah, inside here. Okay, so this causes water to diffuse from the xylem into the sieve tube via osmosis. So the water from here go up akan masuk ke sini. Because here is lower, ma. here the concentration higher. Can you understand this mechanism? Okay, can understand? So close concentration high here, so water potential lower. Sini water potential higher, so dia akan masuk ke dalam situ untuk osmosis. Okay, yes, high to low lah. Okay, now continue. Water diffusion, uh, diffusion increases the hydrostatic pressure in sieve tube. Dia lebih banyak water pressure ma. So how it will increase in hydrostatic pressure cause the phloem sap to be pushed along the sieve tube to other organs of the plant. So from here, it will push lah. Push to maybe other organs of the plant. Push, 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 push. Push lah, push everywhere to the root. On top also lah, actually, it can push on top lah. Understand? Ah, because here banyak water lah, so dia akan push lah. Okay, and then what happened? In, uh, phloem cell is transported from the sieve tube to other parts such as stem, roots, shoot, fruits and tubers by active transport lah. Okay, high water potential in the phloem causes the water to diffuse in order for it to return into the xylem by osmosis. That means, you see, now here a lot of water already. Concentration is high, water potential high already. Sini pula, water potential low because all your water already uh, abs uh, already move up and also into the flow. So, terbahit lah. Sini, your water higher already. So, it will move back inside here and then go up again. Understand? So, it's like a cycle like that. The water go in here, push, push, push. And then, uh, sini, water potential higher. So, it will diffuse back into xylem and then continue the cycle, okay? So, the transpiration pulls water along the xylem vessel against the direction of gravitational pull, okay? Can you understand? So, this is the mechanism of um, translocation. Beside the sucrose moving, you need the water pressure to help you to move, okay? So, uh, this one, uh, this one, uh, this page is the one that they asked in the exam, uh, the one, uh, Something radio radioactive carbon dioxide and also radioactive phosphate in the soil. Last. Okay. Okay, phytoremediation. So I think this is the last sort of topic. Basically, phytoremediation means that if the polluted water, you use some special plants to reduce the pollution inside. Last. So it's one of the treatment methods which uses plants for the purpose of degradation, extraction, or elimination of polluted substances. Okay. So you see for this one, Encoronia crescipitae. Uh, or called water hyacinth is used for uh, heavy metals, uh, accumulate heavy metals like copper and lead in water. Okay, so you see, um, the first example is sunflower, okay, used for remediation of soil polluted by explosion of nuclear plant in Chernobyl, Russia. So sunflower, it can absorb radiation here. Yeah? So sunflower acts as a hyperaccumulator which can eliminate heavy metals such as zinc, chromium, copper, lead and nickel and also radioactive substances like cesium and strontium. Okay, so you see some flower actually very strong one. 
Okay, another one is water lettuce. Aquatic plants that are suitable to treat waste water is water lettuce. Uh, fast growth rate can accumulate heavy metals and absorb nutrients in the waste, waste plant. Okay, the third one is water spinach. Okay, absorb mercury from the soil where as the roots of river water spinach are able to absorb heavy metals such as cadmium from the water. Okay, okay, so that's all on phytoremediation. You just have to read through only very short. And that's the end of chapter four. Lah. Can you all understand? Uh, were we right? What do you mean were we right? With a trial exam question. Uh, what do you mean? Which question? Ah, okay. So, okay. The, uh, there is like two parts to the question, right? One is the... Uh, I also cannot remember. One is the two plants one. The other one is the part plant are already cut the thing. Right? I can't remember. Uh, basically, the phosphate one is because it's mineral ion in the cell, uh, in the root, uh, in the soil. Right? So, it will become trans it will be cause of transpiration. The one, uh, the one in the uh, carbon dioxide, that one is the leaf. It will pro uh, through photosynthesis produce glucose. That's why um, it's translocation, lah. So because um, here already cut, ma. Okay, here already cut. Okay, this part already cut. So translocation cannot occur, lah. So that means bottom sini they ta other the carbon dioxide, lah. The, the 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 radioactive glucose or whatever, lah. Okay. Ah, uh, understand? When you cut the thing, is you cut the phloem. But sini ada xylem. Transpiration boleh, tapi translocation cannot. Uh, photosynthesis, uh, I don't know lah. Never mind, we just see the schema how later on. Okay, bio, I also don't know schema. I don't dare to say later the schema uh, not same pula. Okay? Okay, so that's all lah for chapter 4. Okay, now let's move to chapter 5. Chapter 5 is a very short chapter. Okay, responses in plan lah. Okay, trial exam also came out responses and also the difference, I think. Okay, now, types of responses. One is tropism, one is the uh, nestic response, okay? So, tropism is response of certain parts of a plant, such as the root and shoot, um, towards the stimulus or away from the stimulus, okay? When some the parts of the plant move towards the stimulus, it's called positive tropism. But it, when it moves away, it's called negative tropism. So we have a few types of tropism. You have to look at characteristic first. Response is permanent and influenced by plant hormones, which is auxin. Okay. So you see, what does it mean permanent? Let's say it's phototropism. From the plant is small until large, the sun is always here. So it will continue to grow towards there. Permanent really. Uh, it won't suddenly like one day straight away move back like that. No, that one is not tropism lah, okay response is slow because it takes a long time but it's uh, and it's not apparent but it's permanent lah, okay response direction is dependent on the direction of the stimulus okay like i said lah, positive tropism towards negative is away cool. okay so types of tropism thick more thick more means touch lah. so thick more tropism is an example will be like morning glory lah. Uh, tendrils exhibit positive thickmotropism because they will coil around the uh, object such as wooden stake for support. Okay, geotropism means towards the ground lah, because of the gravity. So, shoots show negative geotropism, they grow up, roots show positive geotropism. Okay, now hydrotropism is the plant response to water. Lah. Okay, so the roots, of course, will move towards the water. Phototropism is towards light, so should move towards the light. Chemotropism is plant response to chemical. So root show positive chemotropism when they grow towards mineral salt. Lah. The fertilizer, they need it for their growth. But if it's chemical, then they will move away. Lah. Poison or all this. Okay? So very easy only. The next one is nastic response. We also have a few types. But the characteristic is different. Okay? Not all nastic response are growth response. The response is very quick one. That means uh, very apparent, very quick one. Very quick. It's not like take a uh, very long, like when there's uh, the stimulus, it will straight away change the direction uh, like that. Some nasty response are intended for survival. Now, what are the types? Okay, first one is photo nasty. Okay, photo nasty example is Japanese roses. Uh, when there's light stimulus, straight away, very quick, open ready. Okay, when at night they were close, uh, it's straight away one. It's, it doesn't take a long time. Okay, that is called photo nasty. 
Seismonasty is due to the mechanical stimulus such as shock, touch, wind, and raindrops. Huh? Like you see, mimosa species, um, when you touch it, straight away, automatically, um, the response will be to uh, fold its leaf inwards. Lah, okay, that is called uh, seismonasty. Okay, nictinasty is circadian rhythm. What does it mean, circadian rhythm? That means it's already like a, a biological clock like that. They have a schedule, uh, a, a cycle. Lah. That means like, okay, uh, night time like this, read, confirm that it will, uh, how to say, uh, unfurl, uh, not unfurl, close at night. And then during daytime, it will open. Okay, so this is called nictinasty. Already have the cycle, circadian rhythm, okay, that respond towards darkness. Thermonasty, thermo means the temperature, lah. Okay, so uh, increase in temperature uh, will open the tulip where close when the temperature drops. Okay, thermonasty is towards vibration, normally by animals, lah. Okay, uh, like you see Venus fly, fly trap, it detects the fly moving the vibration, so it will close, lah, automatically, very fast one, clamp together, lah, and trap the inside inside. Okay, can you understand? Continue. For phytohormone. Now, these responses are uh, because of phytohormone. Okay, I know here you see, oh, you the function, you look ready, you confirm, scared ready because so many things to remember. You don't go and remember everything, you just know the basic. Lah. What is it for? Okay, so auxin, you must know auxin. Okay, actually, auxin is also called um, indole. Okay, auxin. Indole. Three acetic acid, or we also call it IAA for short, lah. Okay, so this is oxy. Okay, indole three acetic acid. Okay, this is oxy. So now oxy, you just have to know. Um, it's for the growth of the plants. Okay, so you see phototropism, geotropism. It will respond towards the plant and growth of the plant, lah. Anything relating to growth of plant is always auxin and it's more of like a positive hormone. Development of apical dominance, growth and elongation of root, okay, development of uh, adventitious root, stimulate cell division, uh, inhibits abscission and also growth of lateral buds, okay. Gibberellin is also similar to auxin but gibberellin is less common, okay. And it's more to the growth and elongation, lah, gibberellin. So, auxin is positive one. Gibberellin is also positive, okay? Stimulates growth and elongation in the stem cell. Uh, and then, yeah, development of leaf flower fruits, all this stuff. It's almost similar to auxin, but it's less popular, okay? Inhibits developments of growth. Okay, the... Uh, some of these hormones, they have opposite effect, which is like inhibits development of root. Lah. Later, we'll see the... the the graph and then you understand really why okay cytokinin is also positive it helps for cell division because you see cytokinin cyto is like cytoplasm right so it uh, it stimulates the cell division macam tu lah okay stimulates division and elongation of root and stem cell when auxin is present stimulates seed germination inhibits development of apical dominance delay leaf senescin senescin means like um dying like that, okay? Stimulates growth of lateral bloods. Okay. Abscisic acid is negative. You look at the word acid, you also know like, it's more to like harmful like that. So, it's a negative one, you see? Because why? It inhibits the growth of plant. Prevent the growth of the plant. Stimulate abscission of mature fruits, leaves and flowers. Abscission means like it will mature or it will fall out like that, okay? Uh, induces seed dormancy. Induces stomata closing inhibits growth of the part. So you see, it's more to negative. Huh? I prevent this from growing. I prevent this from opening. I want the leaves to fall like that. Huh? Okay, ethylene is positive. Ethylene, when you see ethylene, uh, the word that comes to your head is ripening. Okay, everything like the banana or tomato, right? Everything is ethylene. There will be ethylene gas, okay? Stimulates ripening in fruit, senescent process in plants, abscission of leaves and fruit, huh? Okay, so ethylene is very important for ripening. The two most important here is just auxin and ethylene. Nah. Okay, so these are all the phytohormones. Phytohormone means the hormones in plants. Ah. Okay, 
hope you understand ah. Uh, no, the IAA name not compulsory. You just know auxin saja. I'm just telling you extra information lah. Okay. You just know auxin enough really. Okay. Um. Okay. So now let's. Okay. Before I go here, I just want to skip to the next subtopic, which is related also lah to what we learned just now. Uh, which is the uh, this one application of phytohormone in agriculture. So you see, ah, one more thing. Trial, other satu is like watermelon. Okay, the watermelon no seed. Okay, but they don't ask about all oh, this phytohormone. They just ask lah how the survival macam tu. Okay, uh, you see here. Okay, auxin encourages growth. Okay, uh, okay, one thing you see. The third point very important. Produces fruit without seeds which is called parthenocarpy, okay? So the watermelon, why no seed? Because you sprinkle or you spray auxin hormone on the fruit. When you spray the auxin hormone on the fruit or the plant, it's called parthenocarpy. That means you produce the plant or the fruit without the seed lah. Ah, so this is auxin lah, one of the importance of auxin also. Okay, this is uh, very important lah. You have to remember parthenocarpy. Okay, uh, producers, okay, use as wheat killer, induces dormancy in potato, promotes growth of low-lying and large plants, okay. The next one is gibberellin. Okay, gibberellin is also growth, so treats mutated dwarf plants, promotes rapid elongation, produce larger grade, promotes germination of seeds lah, okay. Cytokinin is cell division, right? So, tissue culture lah. Tissue culture, you know, ma, promotes the cell division, so it's used in tissue culture, Tissue culture, uh, you see, or gain tissue culture and used to delay leaf senescence in newly cut flower. Ascaric acid, okay, like I said, is negative, prevent the growth, right? So inhibits germination and growth, lah. Okay, the next one is ethylene. Ethylene uh, is positive, which is ripening, right? So used commercially to promote maturation, fruit quickly and evenly, promote simultaneous flowering in plants in the field. Ah, uh, understand? So this ethylene, ethylene gas is easily released by a uh, ripe banana, okay? They release a lot of ethylene gas. Okay, now we backtrack a bit. You go back to the rows of auxin, okay? Now remember, the auxin, okay, uh, phototropism, that means growth towards light. Now, how does auxin uh, helps in the phototropism we see? The response direction of shoot tip depends on the direction of the lead, uh, light stimulus, okay? So, the distribution of auxin in the shoots is uniform if the shoots are exposed to the light from all directions. This causes the shoots to grow upwards. When the shoots are exposed to light from only one direction, auxin will move away from the light. Remember, auxin will move to the dark side, the shaded side, okay? Concentration of auxin is higher on darker side. Let's say if this is the shoot, okay? This is the sun. Left side is sun. So, right side is darker, right? So, the auxin akan accumulate more on the right side over here. Dia akan accumulate di sini, right side. Now, because it accumulates here, auxin, remember the function? Stimulate growth. So, more auxin on the right side, right side grow even faster and longer. So, that's why it will become like this. Uh, the right side is longer than the left side. The left side like that will be. Okay, that's why it grows towards the sun, lah, left side. Understand or not? Huh? The auxin will accumulate at the, the darker shaded side. So, there will grow longer. Lah. The cells will grow even faster. That's why it will bend towards the sun, to the left side. Can you understand how does auxin function? Okay, uh, auxin, okay, cells in the shaded side elongate more than the cells in the bright side. As a result, it should bend towards light. Lah. Okay. Before we move on, you have to know, um, for this, okay, what if you do a few experiments towards it? Let's say you cut the, okay, if you cut the tip, the, the auxin is only at the tip. So, if you cut the tip, no, it won't grow lah because there's no auxin really. Man. If you cover with an opaque cover, remember opaque. When it's opaque, there's no light. When there's no light, auxin will be evenly distributed lah because it won't move to where the it will avoid the brighter side or move to the shaded side. No, because you just cover with an opaque cover. So there's no light or whatever. It will, the auxin will just evenly distribute and continue to grow upwards lah. If transparent, yes, because the light can penetrate the transparent cover. Base of coleop town tip is covered with an opaque object. If the base is covered but the tip not covered, 
as normal lah. It will bend towards the light lah because oxygen is only at the tip lah. Now, if it's separated by a piece of agar block, agar remember is like jelly. It still can diffuse. The oxygen still can diffuse, but if it's separated by mica, mica is like marble like that. It's too thick already. It's too uh yeah dense and thick. So the oxygen cannot um uh, how to say cannot diffuse and cannot grow lah. Okay, I hope you understand yeah all this. Now you move on to geotropism. So oxygen plays a role in two tropism. One is phototropism. One is geotropism. Okay, geotropism uh, dia akan terbalik. For roots, they are kind positive geotropism because the oxygen can cause it to move downwards. But for the shoot, it will be negative geotropism because it moves upward. Okay, so you see. Okay, for the shoot, ah, high oxygen concentration at the bottom of the shoot tip stimulates cell elongation. So it will accumulate at the lower part of the shoot so that it grows longer and it will move upwards. Tapi untuk root dia berbeza, high oxygen concentration at the bottom of the root tip inhibit cell elongation. So the one on the top will move, uh, will elongate more, and then will move downwards, lah. Okay. So in shoot, negative geotropism, the oxygen will stimulate cell elongation, but for the root, okay, positive geotropism inhibit the cell elongation. Can you understand? Uh, the inhibit, okay. Ah, eh, hey, don't have the graph. Ah, see me. Hey, we look past the graph already. Oh, oh yeah, I think we, we literally missed this page. Oh God. Okay, I think, okay, just now is the same thing. Lah. This one I'm explaining. Okay, now, I uh, sorry I missed this page. Okay, so you see, oxygen concentration, sedikit saja, the root akan grow sikit. Lepas tu, if the concentration continue to increase, it will inhibit the growth of root already. You understand? Roof, dia hanya, uh, root dia hanya mau sedikit oxygen saja. Lepas tu, if too much, it will inhibit really. But should berbeza, should a bit also not enough. Dia mau banyak. Okay, you need a lot of oxygen for the growth of the shoot. That's why it will grow lah, the shoot. Uh, tapi untuk root dia inhibit lah. It won't grow lah. Can you understand the graph? Um, that means if a lot lah, not to say excess, but if a lot, the root akan inhibit lah. Uh, in plants, normally a lot of oxygen hormone. Lah. That's why the shoot will grow, the root, root will inhibit. Lah. Okay, can lah. Okay, now, chapter 6 is my favorite topic in plants. Actually, um, it's also my favorite reproduction topic because I like reproduction in plants. Lah. It's very interesting. Yeah, I tell you, chapter 6 is the most interesting. More things to memorize, but not as bad as the chapter 3. Lah. That one is memang terrible. Lah. You have to memorize every word. But chapter 6 actually is just the process. Macam ni, dia jadi macam ni, macam ni, macam ni. It's so, um, how to say, it's fascinating lah. You have double fertilization and then you have your eight different nucleus lah. It's nice lah, chapter 6. It's much more interesting than human reproduction. Yeah, mega spore. You just have to know, untuk the sperm or male parts, which is the pollen. Okay, you see, sperm is the smallest cell in our body, right? Whereas ovum is the largest, right? So ovum or the female parts of the plant will be mega spore lah, mega lah, big ma. Whereas the pollen will be micro lah because it's like the sperm like that. So micro spore lah. And then when got mother, that means it's the uh, parent cell lah, it's the parent, how to say ah? The parental cell lah. It's not the daughter cell lah. Uh, later, I'll explain again. This is how you remember. Megaspore, microspore. Who oh, this? Reproduction. No, remember. Flowers uh, or plants, uh, we actually have two types of reproduction. The first one, asexual, is not very interesting. Lah, so they, and it's not very complex, so we don't mention in our syllabus. It's like vegetative reproduction. Okay. The second one is more interesting, which is sexual reproduction in plants. Uh, so it's more complex. Huh? Okay. First of all, you have to know the structure of the flower, which you already have learned in, in form one. Lah. Okay. So for the male reproductive organ of the flower is called stamen. It consists of the anther and filament. Okay. And then there will be pollen sacs uh, at the anther. Lah. Okay. For the female, um, 
the female reproductive organ is coupled, which consists of stigma, style, ovary, and ovula. Okay. And then you have petal, uh, you have sepal, you have pedanke. Okay. Uh, so comparison, uh, okay, basically it's the same thing. Basic, uh, basically, there will only be one female like style in the middle, whereas there will be a lot of anther and filament at the sides lah, of the uh, flower. Okay. Okay, now flower, we have three types, okay? We have three types of plants or flower lah. If let's say the flower, if let's say, okay, this is the flower lah, okay? Um, mm, very terrible drawing. Okay, let's say you only have um, all this enter and filament, okay? Enter and filament. You have no style, everything. So this one, this flower, okay? This flower is like a male flower lah. Okay, male. But if your flower only has the female organ, you have the stigma and style only, okay? You don't have your uh, anther and filament, then it's a female flower, lah, okay? Female. This flower is female. Okay. But what if you have both, like in the diagram here? If you have both, it's like, um, it's bisexual. So, uh, okay, you have your style, you have your stigma and your style, and then you have your enter and filament. Okay. Okay, this one we call it hermaphrodite. This is hermaphrodite. Okay, easy to understand, right? Okay, so only female or hermaphrodite, you have the style, you have your ovary, ovule, everything. So only these two can produce fruit, okay? Male flower cannot produce fruit, yeah? Okay, because you don't have the ovary, everything. Can you understand? Now we move into detail. Okay, before that, the similarity and differences, same thing, both produce gametes, both located at flower's organ, but the difference is male is consists of stammer, female is couple, male has filament and enter, female has stigma, ovary, and style, male produces pollen grain, female is embryo sac, projecting out from the base of ovary, located in the middle part of the flower. Okay. Okay, now we look at the development, okay? So... Uh, pollen grains in enter. We focus on the male first, enter, okay? Remember, like I said just now, male, um, if in humans, smaller cell in the body is sperm, largest is ovum. So, you see, small is micro, okay? So, that's why the cells involved here will be microspore. Ingat, microspore saja, tak ada mega, okay? Mega is female because ovum is the largest, okay? So, microspore. Now, you see, during development of enter, a group of tissue grows inside each loop to form four pollen sacs, okay? One loop has four pollen sacs, okay? Now, in the pollen sac, there is hundreds of pollen mother cells. The parent cell is called microspore mother cell. The other mother, it has the word mother because it's the parent cell, lah, okay? Microspore mother cell, okay? Which is deployed. Remember, the parent cell is always deployed. Daughter cell are can't haploid. The gamete are can't haploid. Okay, so you see, produce the daughter cell already, it will become, uh, okay, it undergoes meiosis to produce four daughter cells, which are haploid. Lah. So the daughter cell, are not there, the other, the, don't have the word mother, lah. it's just microspore cell. Lah. Okay, no have mother, ah, only microspore cell. Now, this four microspore uh, spore cell is called a tetra. Okay, remember, tetra, uh, uh, tetra means Four. So, tetrad lah, okay? Each cell in the tetrad develops into a pollen grain, okay? One microspore cell becomes one pollen grain, okay? And then, later on, each of these pollen grain, the nucleus will divide into two, okay? Mitosis, generative nucleus and tube nucleus. Later, we'll look at the function, okay? Wall of the pollen set, which is thick and waterproof, breaks and when the pollen grain matures. So, when it matures already, the enter will break lah. Okay, pollen grains are released. Can you understand this one? Ingat, male relating to pollen, everything is microspore, microspore, microspore. Micro saja, kecil, kecil. Okay, yeah, very easy only, right? It's compared to the humans, you're from 4, chapter 15. Oh, you, this process lah, 
primary usat lah, secondary usat lah, lagi susah. This one easy only what? This one only one uh, microspore mother cell become undergo meiosis for microspore cell and then uh, form the tetrad and then undergo mitosis to produce two nucleus lah. That's all only. Uh. Uh, humans uh, is because humans you have the hormones involved that's why uh, okay so i tell you plant reproduction is more interesting and it's actually easier okay now let's look at the mother punya side lah. let's look at the female side okay um, okay formation of embryo sac the male just now form the pollen grain now female will form the embryo sac you have to look at the structure first okay so ovules are structure of flower formed inside the couple Okay, ovules develop form a layer of tissue inside the ovary. A sing single ovary may contain one or more ovule. Ovule attaches to the ovary wall through a stalk called a funicle. Okay, that means um, the ovary wall, there will be a branch called a funicle to connect to the ovule. Lah. Okay, uh, area of attachment of the funicle to the ovary is called the placenta. All right, the placenta supplies, like in humans, lah, supply the nutrients, lah, all that, lah. Okay, a mass of tissue inside the ovary develops, forming a lump called the nucellus. Okay, so the nucellus consists of parenchyma tissue. Parenchyma nucellus tissue develop into two layers called the integument. At the end of the integument, there's little opening called the micropile. Okay, which allows the entry of air and water into the seed during germination. One of the nucellus cell is the megaspore mother cell, or also known as the embryo sac mother cell. Lah. Okay, uh, yeah, which will develop to form an embryo sac. Okay, this one is not too important. The more important one is the one bottom, the formation. Itu baru important. The structure don't need to go and memorize. Huh? Oh, this one, this one, this one. No need. The formation itu lagi important. So you see, okay. Inside this um, embryo, uh, embryo set or uh, ovule lah, okay. Ingat, ovary is the, oh not ovary, sorry. Ovum is the bigger cell in the human body. And... Uh, embryo uh, embryo sac tu besar kan that's why it's called megaspore lah and then the parent cell is called mother lah so megaspore mother cell which is diploid uh, meiosis again okay produce four daughter cell lah four haploid megaspore cell okay uh, okay for female it's a bit harder already because you see three of the megaspore cell okay you see first of all you have a megaspore mother cell Megaspore mother. Okay, cells. Okay. Produce four megaspore cell. Okay. Same like in humans. Humans, you produce one secondary oocyte. The other three polar bodies akan mati. Okay. It will disintegrate, remove. Same here. It produce four megaspore cell. Tapi tiga akan, you see here what it says? Um, degenerate and only one megaspore cell develop lah. Sama seperti human lah. Only one ovum lah. Okay. Only one will survive. The other three will degenerate. Okay. So, the nucleus of the cell that has developed, this is haploid already. Okay. This is, uh, this is diploid. This is haploid. Okay. Now, the interesting part is it will divide mitotically two times to produce eight nucleus. Okay. One nucleus, okay, times two already. First time, times two already, you have two. Times two again, you have four. One, two, three, four. Times two again. Then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Lah. You understand? From one megaspore cell, divide by mitosis three times, you can produce eight. Okay, eight nucleus inside this embryo sac. Can you understand so far? One megaspore divide. This is well, what's different than humans. Lah. It will divide by mitosis three times to produce eight nucleus. Okay, very easy only actually. Okay, so this eight nucleus, let's see what happens. Okay, so inside this embryo sac, three nucleus will move up here. Three, the atas sini is called antipoder. Antipoder cell. Three here, antipoder. Then you have five more. Okay, what happened? Two here is called polar nuclei. In the middle here is polar nuclei. Okay, and then you after five ready, you have three more. One here, the, the main one is the egg cell. And then you have two more. Okay, two more over here, which is the 
a uh, synergic cell. Okay, this one you have to memorize lah, but actually it's not too hard lah. Okay, remember the the boss lah. The boss is the egg cell. Okay, the the one guarding the boss, like guard, uh, guarding lah. Uh, beside is called the synergic cell. Okay, opposite is antipodal cell. In the middle is two polar nuclei. Okay, understand? So all these eight nucleus become like that lah. Okay, now. In plants, double double fertilization occur. We call it double because two things will be fertilized. The first one is the egg cell lah. The boss akan uh, fertilize. The second one is the two polar nuclei will be fertilized. Okay? Can ya? This is the formation of the micro omega spore cell and also the micro spore cell just now. Okay? If you understand this, then only we can move on to the process of fertilization. Okay, so fertilize uh, pollination, you know lah, from the enter here, move, 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 it will transfer until the stigma here lah. Okay, so see, from uh, process of this formation of pollen tube and male gametes. Okay, wall of enter from mature pollen, dry shrink, and uh, it will burst lah. So pollen grains are released. Release pollen grain transfer to the stigma of same flower or different flower by pollinating agent. So the pollen grain have been transferred to the stigma will germinate and form a pollen tube. Okay. Remember, okay, when the pollen grain reach here already, remember there is two nucleus, right? Just now, one is generative nucleus, one is tube nucleus. So, it will form a, a pollen tube lah, to, into the ovary, okay? It will form a pollen tube. The pollen tube grows down towards the ovule through the star lah. The generative nucleus will move along the pollen tube. Uh, okay, okay. So, you see, inside this pollen tube, Inside this pollen tube, remember got two, right? One is tube nucleus, one is generative nucleus. Okay, remember, tube nucleus, because this is pollen tube, right? So, tube nucleus will be like the boss, lah, driver. Akan menjadi satu driver di sini. It will be like the driver. It will guide the other one. Okay, it will guide the generative punya. Because this is pollen tube, ma, pollen tube. That's why you see tube, right? The tube nucleus will guide the generative one. Okay? It's like leading lah. Okay? Big brother guiding the younger brother. Okay? And then generative, you see? Generative, the younger brother, okay? It will divide by mitosis to form a uh, two generative nucleus. Okay? Remember why? Because double fertilization. Satu fertilize egg cell, satu fertilize polar nuclei. That's why? The generative, it will generate lah, uh, divide by mitosis to form two. Can you understand so far? This is how you remember lah, you use this concept, okay? Pollen tube, the tube nucleus will become the big brother. That's why it will guide the younger brother down lah. Okay, understand? Okay, lepas tu, okay, two male gametes ready. The end of the pollen tube will secrete an enzyme to digest the tissue of the star lah. So it will penetrate the ovule lah, masuk ke dalam sini, Okay. When it reaches the embryo sac, the pollen tube will penetrate the ovule through the micropile, the small hole there, and then the tube nucleus will degenerate, okay? So, this tube nucleus eventually will die lah because dia tak akan involve in fertilization. Yang kedua-dua ini akan involve, okay? So, one fertilize the egg cell, one fertilize the polar nuclei. Now, let's see how does this happen, okay? When it reaches the embryo sac, pollen tube will penetrate the ovule through the micropile, Tube nucleus degenerate. So, we'll have the two male gametes left. Lah. Okay. One of the male gametes fertilize the egg cell to produce a diploid zygote. You see here, one generative nucleus and dengan egg cell to egg cell, also another end, it will produce a diploid zygote. Lah. Okay. But the other one, the other generative nucleus or the male, uh, how to say, the male gamete, okay, will fertilize the two polar nuclei. So you see, it will fertilize two polar nuclei. One polar nuclei is haploid. So you see, total is already three. So it will form a triploid endospermic nucleus. Now, why do they need this endosperm nucleus? It's because to form the cotyledon. You remember cotyledon store the food used for seed germination. Ah, that's why you see, this is called double fertilization. Nah? One fertilize the egg cell to form diploid zygote. 
One, fertilize the two polar nuclei to form triploid endosperm nucleus. Faham ke? Ah, habis lah. Fertilization stop ready lah here. This is the entire process. Okay. Can you understand? Can is easier than human one. You don't have to think of hormone or what mitosis, meiosis, any phases or so. It's just like this lah. Okay, the process. First of all, you have to know the formation of the cell first. Formation of the microspore cell and the megaspore cell. Lepas tu, megaspore cell akan form eight nucleus. Okay, lepas tu, pollination. Okay, what happened? Generative nucleus divide into two lah to form two male gamete. Okay, and then fertilization. How? Penetrate the ovule through the micropile. And then what? Fertilize what lah? To form what? Habis. Okay. Okay, and then in the end, the synergy cell can disintegrate, antipodal cell disintegrate lah. Okay, importance of double fertilization, fusion of one of the male gametes with egg cell produce zygote. Okay, what's the importance of the zygote? Genetic information is passed down lah. Restore the haploid condition in gamete with the information, uh, with the formation of diploid zygote. Okay, how about the endosperm nucleus? Triploid endosperm nucleus is because of the endosperm tissue. Tissue is used for development of an embryo for the survival of plant species. Unicot such as legume, mango, and mustard. Endosperm is fully utilized by the embryo to develop before the seed mature. Most monocots are coconut, wheat, barley, and corn. Only a part of the endosperm is utilized for development of embryo. Some of them store in the cotyledon to be utilized during the germination of the seed. Endosperm tissue enables the embryo to survive in the seed for a long time and conditions are not favorable. Remember, this one will form the cotyledon which contains the food and nutrient for the seed germination. Okay, so habis. Now it's just the development of seeds and fruit only. Okay, not the main part of this topic. So, after double fertilization occur, triplet endosperm nucleus divide by mitosis form the endosperm tissue. Endosperm tissue is a food storing tissue. Lah. Okay, which is cotyledon. Zygote divides by mitosis to form two cells, larger cell and smaller cell. Larger cell will become suspensor that anchors to the embryo, to the wall of the embryo sac. Smaller one will become the embryo that consists of plumu, radical, and cotyledon. Remember in your form 1, you learned before, the plumu will form, uh, will become the shoot, the radical will become the root. Okay, that's all. That's all you need for the development and formation. Okay. Ovule uh, develops to become the seed of the fruit. Intergumen becomes two layers of seed coat and serves to protect the embryo during the development of ovule and seed. Ovary develops into a fruit. Lah. So you see, when fertilized already, this entire thing will become a fruit lah, and then the petal will fall off. Okay, Consists of the exocarp, mesocarp, and endocarp. Remember, exo is outside, right? So exocarp is outer layer, mesocarp is the middle, and endocarp is the one inside. Lah. Okay. Now, the last thing, I think it's the last thing, uh, okay, before before the importance, you have to know a few types. Uh. This one, normally not asked in exam, maybe objective can ask. Uh. Okay, so the few types of fruit is simple, aggregate, multiple, and accessory. What does it mean simple? That means fruit developed from a single couple or several couple fused together in a single flower. One flower only, simple fruit, like peas. Okay, aggregate how? Fruit developed from numerous couples in a single flower. That means a lot of couple in one flower to form raspberry. Remember, raspberry is actually a lot of berries together. That's why it's aggregate. Lah. Multiple fruit, that means developed from couple of a cluster of flower. That means banyak flower. Itu multiple fruit, lah, like pineapple. Accessory fruit means uh, fruit develops from a tissue that is not in the ovary but some tissues near the couple. Remember, the these petals actually also will form the tissue of the uh, of the apple. Okay, and then the other petals will fall off. Lah. Okay. Very easy only, lah. not too difficult, this one. So lastly is the importance of the survival. Why do this seed need to survive? Because seed contains the embryo that germinate to form the seedlings. Lah. Inside the seed, endosperm tissue or cotyledon source of nutrients to supply energy. Lah. Okay, Seeds are enclosed by the testa, which is strong and portal impermeable to prevent speed from spoiling. Seeds can form a dormant structure which enables seed to be stored for a long time. Seeds have special features such as light, spongy tissue, strong and do not spoil easily. Lah. So the speed is very important. Lah. The seed coat to protect the seed. Lah. Okay, features like this are important for the seeds are easily dispersed to another place to avoid competition. Okay, so that's all. Lah. This is the survival of plant. Can you understand chapter 6? Okay, please don't get confused. Okay, it's actually a very easy process. You go one by one, small steps by small step. Okay, one step, the second step, third step. What are the stages? Okay.
Okay, good luck if you understand this. Okay, very interesting. Also very short adaptation of plants in different habitats. Okay, so now plants, we have four types. We have uh, halophyte, mesophyte, uh, hydrophyte, and also uh, one more is uh, xerophyte. Okay, adaptation, we only focus on the tree, which is the unusual ones. Okay, the mesophyte, is the usual one we see like rambutan tree, mango tree, whatever tree that is normal lah in our surrounding, not in the desert region or water regions, all this lah, okay? Because adaptation is only the special features, ma. that's why we focus on the three types of plant lah. Okay, so you see, halophyte is the one that grows in swampy area, high con salt concentration like mangrove lah. Plants that live in swampy habitats at the river mouth, the meeting point of fresh water and seawater, this swampy area is rich in salt like mangrove. Okay. Hydrophyte. Hydro means water, right? So grow in water, lah, aquatic habitats, surface of water or submerged in the water, like lotus and elodia species. Mesophyte is the normal one, lah. grow in normal land like that. Plants that live in a habitat that is not too dry or not too wet, adequate supply of water. Most plants are emesophyte like mango, hibiscus, rubber tree. Xerophyte is the one that lives in hot and dry uh, habitats such as desert, lah. minimum presence of water, uh, high temperature such as cactus and dead palm. Okay, so um, let's look. So we will focus on halophyte, hydrophyte, and xerophyte. Let's look at their adaptive features. Okay, so Adaptive features of the mangroves of halophyte already repeated lah. In chapter eight also, uh, not eight. In chapter nine also, they repeat already. Here also, they repeat again lah. Okay, so live in a habitat with high concentration of salt, low oxygen content. Okay, so let's see the leaves first. What is the special adaptation? Leaf will be thick cuticle. Okay, thick cuticle, sunken stomata because you less exposed to the sun ma, can reduce the rate of transpiration. Succulent leaves can store water. Like I explained before, succulent means that it is very thick, like the aloe vera, you know, very thick, right? So it can store a lot of water. Even the cactus, the stem also is very succulent and thick. Lah. Okay, leaves with a spe special structure known as hydatode to eliminate the excess salt. All leaves can store salt. And then when they store the salt, if there's too much salt ready, they will fall off. Lah. Okay, now how about roots? Root system branches widely and exist in various shapes and sizes, okay? So you have three types of roots. You have um, you have pneumatophore, you have uh, buttress root, and then you have prop, prop root. Lah. All these will be in the chapter uh, nine, in the chapter nine that I have discussed already. Lah. Okay, so root system of mango tree also produce hundreds of breeding roots that grow vertically upwards above the surface of the soil. That means the soil, it will grow upwards, lah, called pneumatophores. And on this pneumatophore, there will be a lot of tiny, tiny pores. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So this tiny pores is called lenticles. Lah. Okay, so these lenticles enable the gaseous exchange because the this um is low oxygen content. So leaves gaseous exchange they touch cook. There must be other pneumatophore root to enable gaseous exchange. Okay. So cell sap of mango tree has higher salt content than water, than seawater. Okay, so when they have a higher salt content than seawater, water potential is lower in the roots. That's why the seawater can diffuse inside lah. Uh, can diffuse inside by osmosis lah. This ensures that they do not lose water. Okay, can you understand halophyte or mangrove? Um, yeah, keywords. You just have to know the function like how lah you focus on the leaf macam mana, roots macam mana. Okay. Ah, uh, bolded, yeah. I mean the leaves and uh, all these roots adaptive structure you must know lah. Okay, okay. Next one is hydrophyte. So hydrophyte is in wet habitat lah, a uh, pond or maybe like a uh, lake uh, all this lah, aquatic habitat. Okay. So let's see. Okay, example is uh, Acronia species, Hydrilla species, and Elodia. Okay, or lotus also. So floating pan plants such as the lotus are plants that grow by floating on the water surface lah, and uh, not anchored to the bottom okay leaves are broad and thin it must be thin so that it is light lah. it can float on the water okay and then this helps for maximum sunlight for photosynthesis stomata is distributed on upper epidermis not the lower because remember upper is not the air di atas lah. that's why you can conduct photosynthesis lah. but the one bottom is less stomata and then okay upper epidermis co covered by a waxy wet waterproof cuticle ensure the stomata always open 
and then the stem, there will be air spaces inside the stem. We call this errant karma tissue, okay? You know, air, like air, aeration like that, like, it's lighter, so it can float here and there. This is called errant karma tissue. Like. So this is the ones for floating. But the ones inside uh, the water or at the uh, like the base or the base or the floor of the uh, aquatic habitat, submerged plants such as Elodia species grow completely inside the water. Okay, they have leaves that are thin and small to increase the total surface area per volume. Okay, TSA over V, yeah, to increase the diffusion rate of water, mineral salt, and dissolve gases into the plants through the epidermis. So you see. Above here, all the diagram you see, so small. The leaves are very, very small. Okay? Uh, and then, submerged plants do not have stomata and waxy cuticle on the leaves. Uh, their stem, which are small and hollow, help these plants flow around in the water and help to reduce water flow resistance. Okay? So, also quite easy for this one. The last one is xerophyte. That means grow in the desert like cactus. Lah. Okay, so, in contrast to hydrophyte, xerophyte live in desert, very little rainfall can overcome this problem, how they adapt and survive is roots of xerophyte is very wide, they grow very widely and then they can grow very deeply, penetrate deep into the soil to absorb water and mineral salt. Absorb water is stored in the root stems and leaves beside the stem of the cactus carries out photosynthesis, okay? So you see, uh, the cactus, actually they are small leaves and thick waxy cuticle but they have already modified into thorns. One, to prevent animals from biting the cactus. Number two is, this reduce the total surface area exposed to the sun. Lah. Because the leaves so large surface area, but thorn so small, that's why it reduced the water loss. Okay? So this is the adaptive feature of the uh, leaves. Lah. Okay? Just now is the root ready and then the leaves. Okay, then you see. Presence of thorns also help the cactus to get water supply by collecting dew. That means condensed ready, the water vapor will collect the dew. Lah. The dew will drop on the ground, absorbed by the roots. And then the thorn can also prevent the plant from being eaten by animals. Tomata in the cactus is embedded to reduce water evaporation from the leaf. Sunken tomata lah, reduce the exposure to the sun. Okay? So this is for xerophyte. And that's all lah for this chapter. Anyone confused or not sure uh, for this chapter? You just have to use your logic to think lah. Okay, like for example, mangrove, low oxygen content, high uh, salt concentration. How can it survive? Okay, for aquatic habitat, how can it survive? For desert, no water, little water, how can it survive? Okay, not too hard lah, this one. Yeah, use most of your logic lah. Okay, and then normally focus on the leaf and the roots. Focus on these two, enough ready. A lot of features lah. Okay, lah. so that's all for our biology syllabus. We have uh, managed to cover uh, all 13 chapters for Form 5 in 4 classes. So thank you very much for your cooperation. Lah. Thank you very much, everyone. Feel free to ask any question. If you, have, uh, yeah, if you have any question, feel free to ask them anytime. Thank you, everyone. Okay, see you and bye-bye.